Oh, Conor McKeown of the Herald is here. Good morning to you. Morning, lads. You, uh, you're running the gauntlet of our most controversial slot here, where we uh, we have power rankings of the best ten footballers in the country. I'm always going for an early morning row. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we get to that, uh, congratulations on the exclusive about Bernard Brogan. You managed to break the news that he'd done his cruise ships. Um, still no official confirmation from the Dubs, is there? No, it's not really the way they operate. Um, you know, you don't see much of Jim Gavin between games, uh, and anything official will only really ever come from Jim Gavin. Um, if he had been out for the year, as in um, if he had kind of accepted it and gone for cruciate ACL surgery, I think we probably would have seen some sort of press release. Yeah. The fact that they've had nothing would, I think, indicate that Bernard is going to try and uh, go through that laborious process of you know, building up the stability and strength and the need to try and play some part this summer. And I suppose in some ways you can see that like Dublin are going to be in the Super 8s this year, I think they'll probably need a bigger panel. Than, well, they will use more players than they have usually done, so he yeah. will potentially get more game time. So I think that will probably be, be confirmed on Saturday night by, by Jim Gavin down in, uh, in Castle Bar. That's tricky. That, that It's very hard to do. Um, I didn't realise that MDMA had tried to do exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And like he, you know, he got on the pitch. He played, uh, I think he played against... Um, Monaghan, he got on in the All Ireland quarter final um, and got through the entire season. But I think it's an inexact science, you know. It's not yeah. some people it works for others. It some doesn't. people it works for and other people it doesn't. Exactly it, you know. And you always run the risk then that you know if you spend four months, five months rehabbing the injury and then it goes on you, you have to then have the surgery. So yeah. you're, you're 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 kind of throwing yourself back six months and you're probably ruling out all of next year as well. Was there a sense that this was? in Bernard Brogan's mind and I know I'm asking you to get inside the mind of somebody that this was his final season or that actually he was going well enough at the start of the season to think oh, you know what I'm just going to keep going until yeah I don't know he um I think he got him I think he was very disappointed with how last year panned out in that he got himself in very good physical shape I think uh, probably as lean and as fit as he'd been in a long time um, but didn't get the game time maybe that he expected to get. Um, you know, he went well earlier on in the league, but it was, it was a strange kind of year for Dublin last year in that the forward line was very much. You know, I mean, they started an All Ireland final without Paul Flynn, without Bernard Brogan, without Dermot Connolly up there. Yeah. Uh, and people like like Conor Callan really sort of came from nowhere. Paul Mannion ended up the season with an All Star, so. I think there was always a move on Jim Gavin's part to get more pace into his attack last year because in 2016 I think they were very stale in the two games against um, the two final games against Mayo. So um, would this be his final year? I suppose it depends on how it pans out. You know, if it gets to this, if it gets to the end of the year and he has more football, I think Bernard Brogan would find it very hard to walk away from a intercountal football. Yeah, well, I suppose there's that, like you know, like, yeah. But like even you know, some, for some of them it seems to matter. For others, they're like, I don't really care. You know, and I'm just part of this experience, and I like being part of the experience. But the history seems to matter for some of them. Yeah, you find it's like anything, and you know. It kind of brings it back to the whole media engagement thing and people speaking their mind. But you, you find there's very different characters in that Dublin dressing room. Yeah. You know, for some of them, like people like Bernard Brogan and James McCarthy and Dean Rock, whose fathers played for Dublin, they would be aware of the history. Hugely aware of it. Yeah. And there's other guys. It's that this is what we do. You know, we, this is the sport we play. We're going to try and win the thing that we try and win every yeah. year. And you know, the historical significance and the Connolly not quite knowing how many All Ireland medals he had on the field <laughs> after last year it was uh, like an indication that d different different folks yeah. different strokes. I think he I think he briefly forgot. Yeah. But, uh, no, I think he'd be. Very very, I think he'd be aware of, I would hope that he's aware of how many all Ireland's that he has won. Yeah. I wonder, is there a competitive sense of legacy in that Dublin dressing room where Bernard Brogan is thinking to himself, this Dublin team is going to go down as one of the greatest of all time. I need to be the guy that people are talking about in decades to come as the guy who was there from the very start and was still there starting in 2018. I think it's a little bit like, I, I heard Patrick Harrington in here and, uh, when he was in with Joe and, and Paul Kimmage and even in, in his interview with Rory McIlroy and Paul Kimmage the weekend, I think Bernard Brogan's at the, like, People, will, Bernard Brogan's legacy is already written. You know, yeah. he was already footballer of the year in a season when Dublin didn't make an All Ireland final. He was already an incredibly prolific forward who then developed his game to being this kind of all round thing. Now it looked like he was going very well. He started off that night against uh, Kildare and he s set up three or four goal chances. Yeah. I still think with the emergence of Conor Callan, I, I don't think he was going to be a starter this year, regardless. But he no, was going to go out with his boots on, though. There was yeah, like, well, that's he, the he wasn't going to just hand it over to Conor and say, "Oh, you scored those great goals last year. Fair play to you." Like, yeah, I think his I think his his role now is the furthest man forward. That's always been his best role, but I think it's now really the only role that he can play. Mm. And I think that Dublin just have a guy who's who's probably who's younger basically yeah. you know, and, and is a sure bet to start but I know I think he probably would have gotten game time this year um, like he's like all these fellas I remember interviewing Dennis Bastic two years ago three years ago saying why are you coming back he was yeah. 34, 35 and he just said 
great, you know, and like Brian Pro be the same. Like why go out with five All Ireland medals when you have a fair chance of getting a sixth, yeah. you know? So uh yeah, I think his legacy is probably I think he'll go down as one of the great Dublin forwards and definitely one of the most prolific forwards of his generation. You do feel though that like all of the legacies get enhanced if they do five in a row because they're the first team in history to ever do it. Like the, it just adds this extra. You were part of that five in a row team. The way we all talk about the great Kerry team, you were part of that great great Kerry team. That automatically catapults even the lesser players, for want of a better word, into conversations about greatness. And you know, teams in the millennium, whenever they all come to be done. I think so. Like we, the fact that it hasn't been done, the fact that there are a couple of teams that have done four in both codes but yeah. have never done five, that's, it, it's a mythic number. I don't know whether Jim Gavin taking the two extra years that would bring it up to five I mean, if they won it. It's purely a coincidence. <laughs> like, it means nothing. We can't read anything into that. He only takes it day by day as far as I can make out. <laughs> but, uh, uh, like it would be, like, you know, I, I, I have to say, I'd still be surprised if they did it. Like, I mean, I'd still be surprised if you went five full years without yeah, am- you amazing. Know, getting snagged somewhere along the way. But, um, at the moment, it wouldn't necessarily bet against it. And I suppose if you did do it, like we haven't seen it, seen it done before, so, you know, I think we'd be talking about them in, in different tones now. Totally, today, yeah. Because we, like, we do talk about, and rightly so, Tommy Walsh and JJ and Henry and all the lads has been the greatest hurdles of all time. Yeah. And, and they did four, but I suppose the fact that they won plenty of All-Irelands either side of the four as well secured their legacy. And I think the Dublin footballers are kind of, the great Dublin footballers of this team are, are getting towards that, I think. Very close at yeah. this point, yeah. All right, let's, um, the reason that we're doing this this morning is because obviously we started our uh, Top 10 Footballers of the Year power rankings uh, before the league and naturally enough, Lee Keegan, Dermot Connolly and a bunch of players who aren't playing any football in the league were on that list. Um, are we sticking up our unified, this is the off the ball, list. okay, so this is the current off the ball AM power rankings. Brian Fenton straight in at number one after uh, some towering performances. Um, James McCarthy, Conor McManus, Paddy McBrearty wasn't anywhere on that list uh, originally. Paul Murphy, the lobbyist in chief, is Owen Sheehan for that one. Lee Keegan's still on the list. Cluxton, I think Cluxton's actually got a promotion, has he? Yeah. Damien Comer's on the list. Maddie Donnelly and Aidan O'Shea. So, um, obviously there are some egregious errors in terms of players who are the best footballers in the country mm. who haven't played any football yet. But, should stick the list back up there, Paul, and we'll have a, we'll have a look at it. Connor, annihilate the list for us. That is a different list. That's my list. That's your list. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so this one, oh, there, sorry, we're back to the original list. Uh, uh, I think there's two distinct categories here, right, when you're doing this. You have the players who are the best footballers in Ireland and you have the players who are the most important footballers in Ireland. And I was thinking about this after uh, I was invited on today. And, and it, there are slight differences. Like, I, I think if you're talking about Mayo's most talented footballers, like it's Aidan O'Shea and Lee Keegan, but if you're talking about the most important footballers of the team, Killian O'Connor, absolutely. Like he is the guy that, if you take him out, the standard of the team falls by a mile. And I think Dublin have the same thing as well. Dermot Connolly is absolutely Dublin's most talented footballer. I think in terms of skill, maybe Fenton is probably up there with him. But I think Connolly is the most. He's the guy who's the best at everything. If you know what I mean. Like collectively, he has every skill off to a higher standard than yeah. anybody else does. But there are fellas there that maybe wouldn't feature on people's top 10 lists like Dean Rock or Keno Sullivan, but they are essential to the way Dublin play. Like in a team sport, if you took either of those specialist people out, like nobody sweeps as well as Keno Sullivan reads the play as quick. Dean Rock has become the best free taker, I think, in the country and also now a prolific scorer of important goals. Yeah. But so they might make your top 10, but I suppose that's that's kind of... No, I get it. I, like if you, if you consider back to the Donegal game, um, the smash and grab from Jim McGuinness, like... Keno Sullivan changes the face of Dublin football by his very ability to do the job that he gets asked to do. Now, I don't know if anybody else would have been able to do it because we never saw anybody else get asked to do it because he took to it so quickly. Mm. But like they wouldn't, they wouldn't be sitting here going for four in a row if he wasn't as good as he is. And it's hard because that's not really... like He'll get his all-stars, but it's kind of almost begrudging. It's like, well, sure, what does he really do? <laughs> Who's he marking? Yeah. Space. Space never scored. But actually, I mean, obviously, you know, you think about it this is one of the most important roles that any team has ever had in any sport. Yeah, I think actually the, f- the funny thing about Keno Sullivan is, you know, he's, he's actually had consistent hamstring problems over the last few years, so people might have said, well, you know, that sweeper role suits him because he only sprints when he needs to sprint. You know, he doesn't go all the time. But if you go back to last year's All-Ireland Final, I think he did more man marking in last year's All-Ar- right. All-Ireland Final and actually played more ball in last year's All-Ireland Final than any of the other four that he would have played. Is that because uh, teams are beginning to put him under a bit of pressure? Because May, cause May are the one team... Occasionally, Kerry, but Mayo are the one team that were, are absolutely backed themselves to go man to man with Dublin. Yeah. So in that sort of situation, Dublin will like you know 
in that sort of situation, Dublin won't drop a man. You know, like they'll obviously get men behind the ball when the teams run at them, but Mayo are the one team that will go man to man um, because they believe enough in themselves. And I think that's part of the reason Mayo have come the closest to beating Dublin over the last four years. Yeah, it's funny how Mayo seem to have the style for that. And under James Horan, they obviously had the style to crush all the other teams, but couldn't quite get it done against the bigger teams. Um, and that's why actually this championship could really still be interesting, despite the fact we have uh, one defining team who are great. Let's have a look at Connor's top ten. So mine was kind of predicated on on league form so far, yeah. uh, which is why okay, Connor McManus I think was man of the match at the weekend, but he, he doesn't make it on the basis that I didn't see enough of him. Keegan hasn't played, Connolly hasn't played. Uh, there's probably a few others that I'm leaving out. It's a crucial to point out that Paul Murphy is higher on your list than our collective <laughs> list just after that earlier slice. Uh, yeah, well, I had to get a Kerry man high up the list, and I do think that uh, so far this year, and he's one of these guys that you like to give praise to because he doesn't get enough of it. Um, like if you go back to his man of the match performance in the 2012 All Ireland final, 2014. 2014. Yeah. Sorry, he's one of these guys that just does not give the ball away. Um, like Kerry have problems in defence, but I think their half back line ideally would be himself and Tyg Morley and Peter Crowley on the far wing. I think that's a very, very strong line and I think it's a line that, that will dev continue to develop for Kerry and be a big one. But I think he is he's a very, very smart ball carrier. Um, I remember last year in, in that league game in Tralee when he gave a ball away late on and, and Dublin got the equaliser when Kerry were desperate to yeah. beat Dublin. But it was nearly like an aberration. Like It was a bit like... Everybody was like... Yeah, Brian on? Fenton's sideline kick that he gave away against Donegal, everybody in the stadium took a gasp because these guys make so few mistakes now that when they do it kind of stands out for you. So no, I have no problem putting Paul Murphy high up the list. I think he's a really, really talented footballer. And I and just I suppose just to talk about him I put Sean O'Shea on the list as well. I know he's very new, he's very fresh. But a lot of people and rightfully so, would say that Kerry's full back line was an area in need of surgery. Because yeah. last year, you know, I think Shane, en Shane Enright had his problems, I think Mark Griffin had his problems. But Kerry's half-forward line has been very functional over the last few years. They get scores through Dunica Walsh occasionally and Stephen Bryan um, and Johnny Buckley, but I think Sean O'Shea just brings a different thing. The interesting thing about Sean O'Shea is I think last year there was all this talk that he might have been a bolter for Eamon Fitzmaurice, that he was keeping him back in case they got to the All-Ireland final to spring on Dublin. I had my doubts because, you know, I think Fitzmaurice has been quite a conservative manager selection-wise over the last few years, but haven't seen him so far in this year's league and you think, well, he couldn't have been much worse last August, yeah. last September. Yeah. You think, well, maybe that was a possibility because he's very, very prolific. Um, Fitzmaurice was happy enough to give him the freeze as well over Paul Ganey in the first round of the league against Donegal. So yeah, that was very interesting, I thought. I think he's... He, and there's obviously an awful lot of talk about David Clifford, but, you know, Kerry could be successful this year without David Clifford, but I think that what Sean O'Shea is going to bring to the Kerry half-forward line is a different dimension altogether, and it's an area that they that they probably need something new in. It's kind of like what somebody like Conor Callahan brings. It's, uh, what is this guy actually going to do? We don't have any videotape on him, really. Yeah. Oh, shit, he can do that. I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly that. Um, like, what Conor Callahan did last year was, you know, the same thing every time, but it, it unnerved defenders because I think full forwards nowadays are programmed to go away from goal and to look for the loop or the guy coming around off their shoulder, whereas every time Conor Callan got the ball last year, he just went straight at the full back. And yeah. I, I, I saw that goal in the All-Ireland final recently as well against Mayo, and when you look at when he gets the ball, the Mayo defence, they could not have set it up any better. If they could put the players yeah. on the board, but somehow he managed to find a way and slalom into goal, and I think having that element of surprise is you know, probably a big thing. I wonder, do you only have it for the first couple of years? I wonder, is there like part of your, just the, the way you get conditioned, that, that that's not who he is, that that's how teams now don't know how to deal with it. But in a couple of years' time, they're like, you're going to come straight at me and I'm going to stand there. And yeah, like you've you. seen like, it happen to people like Michael Darren McCauley, who had a huge, a huge um, impact in his first couple of years, was Footballer of the Year, because he could go through tackles and then teams started to kind of back off him and Waitley popped or soloed the ball on the D and try and yeah. take it away from him. Yeah, teams can, I think the teams can, that's where the great players, I think, kind of find another, another part to their game to, to, to develop and still be as effective. Yeah. Is there a trend in the fact that we're seeing the likes of Damien Comer and Paddy McBeerty getting so many plaudits earlier on this season? Is, is there a tactical quirk here that we're already seeing that there's just more, that there's more freedom allowed for these sort of players now? Well, I think the big thing for Paddy McBeerty is that so far this year, and I know they haven't won a game, but it's, it's very obvious that Donegal are trying to change the way they play football. And the way that Donegal played the last few years, you know, run the ball at all costs, run, up, run in lines with fellas with pace. Like, the guy that loses out there is the inside forward, because every time the ball comes near you, it's taken 
the length of time to come up the pitch to yeah. you so everyone else is reset. So you're in yeah. the corner, you have a marker, you have a sweeper, you have a guy who's marking zone. Four runs. You've made four runs and it's very, very difficult. And so there's a couple of things with McBrearty. First of all, he's getting the ball quicker. And second of all, he's got somebody like Aura McNeilish back in the team who's a really, really intelligent passer of the ball. Um, and what McBrearty has as well, um, and actually I saw you had Matty Donnelly on your list. Um, he scored a brilliant goal or a brilliant point against Kildare a couple of weeks ago. What McBrearty has is he can kick the ball very, very accurately running at full speed. Yeah. Um, which, if you remember Dermot Connolly's point against Kerry a couple of years ago, the same thing. Um, McBrearty's point against Kerry this year in the league because you, you, know, you don't have time to set yourself anymore. And he has that little sweet spot out on the left wing. If he takes a small little step to the side to the left, he's just not going to miss. I think as well that people kind of forget that Connolly has peaked over the last couple of years. That in, in the early stages of his career, he was eminently capable of using his skill set, but equally he would kick a lot of wides. And it's not like... It's a fairly natural thing for a forward to learn exactly all of what that skill is like under the extreme pressure as the championship season progresses. Like He was never perfect. It was never a 10 out of 10 from every shot going over from Connolly. And you just kind of lived with it. McBrearty as well, because he's been on the scene since he was 18. Like He's still really a young guy in terms of his age. He's got loads of experience, but maybe putting that all together is something that has just taken a little bit of time. Yeah, I think Connolly's a really interesting one this year as well, because besides the the 12 week ban last year like he he hadn't played well for Vincent's in the in the club championship he, he didn't like the game that he he had the incident against Carlo he hadn't played well that game now he had a very good all-Ireland final the second half when he came on yeah. you could actually argue that of all his all-Ireland final performances that was the most uh, productive like yeah. he kicked a brilliant point he had a great assist if you remember a ball with the outside of his foot to Dean Rock he won that free at the end but Connolly's a fella that you know, we could be sitting here next year and saying, well, you know, he's the reign of footballer of the year and the year Dublin won four in a row because if he gets a run of form, even last year, it was interesting to watch that Mayo put Lee Keegan on Kieran Kilkenny and it's almost like, and I, I wonder if Connolly had a started whether that would have happened anyway yeah. because it's almost like people are saying, well, Kilkenny is the guy who make Dub makes Dublin tick. He's the guy that we need to put our best marker on. And if that happens, well then... Connolly's free. Connolly's free, you yeah. know. Um, and you know, if they put it on Conley, with then Kilkenny three. You know, so I think, I think Conley will benefit by the f virtue of the fact that fellas like Brian Fenton and Kieran Kilkenny uh, and James McCarthy are now kind of the the playmakers, the, the playmakers of the Dublin team. Yeah. they're the guys who are driving this on. I wonder, is there? And it kind of goes back to my last question, just about the role of a half forward at the moment, because I think it was very noticeable with McBearty against Kerry and against Dublin, just the amount of space around the forty-five meter line, yeah. and I guess it's to do with people maybe kicking up or pushing up rather on the opposition kick out and double down with that with the uh, with, with they were bringing in at the mark last year the longer kick outs have been practiced now we're 12 months into the mark so teams have their long kick out strategy so they're going long they've got players deep in their own half and if you win the ball in midfield suddenly you've got a wide open expanse in front of you and I, I think with McBrearty he's benefited, benefited from that hugely the question though is when you go into the Ulster Championship that space isn't going to be there well that's you know, that's the thing we, we have seen and uh, like this is the time of year when we all talk about why the league is so great um, you know teams of a similar ability playing each other much more frequently and then we start to talk about there's been a tactical rethink and we're having these great matches and then yeah. all of a sudden the first round it's of the really Champions thing, isn't it? kicks off and everybody reverts the type I think there probably there probably will be like th there will be an evolution in the thing because, like you know, everybody else in the country wants to do better than they have done over the yeah. last few years. So then, like they know they have to, they have to tweak the thing slightly. Um, the one who seems to be stoically doing what is Mickey Hart, you know. And I think what people miss there is that Tyrone scored hugely last season before they got to the All Ireland semi final. Like they just collapsed. They just collapsed in and the game. Plan B, is yeah, and they were picked apart by Dublin, who would practice the game plan. But if you look at what they scored prior to that in the three games in the Ulster Championship against our man, the All Ireland quarter final, they were on. Their average score in a game was huge. I think it was up around 117, 118. Yeah. So, like, I think Mickey Hart is actually, you know, people get annoyed because when they get so many men behind the ball, we don't get to see lots of goals and points. But, you know, if Mickey Hart is doing it, it's because it's the most efficient way to play. And, you know, the question of whether we're half forwards are getting more space now in the team. We spoke to Lee Keegan about this and he, he last year, and he said that he was definitely noticing that the half back line were being monitored more, that there was there was more man marking going on because the half backs had become the playmakers. Mm. So by consequence, somebody has to be getting more space. And, yeah. You know, maybe it's those half forwards. Yeah, I think I think that would be 
the greatest development for the game if we do end up coming to the Super 8s and what we're seeing in the league now has actually manifested itself in the Super 8s because it is great to see it is great to see the likes of Shawnee O'Shea kicking points from 50 yards out from play because you mentioned him getting the freeze off Ganey in the first game he's grabbed the headlines because of what he's done from play the same at McBearty uh, despite the fact that whatever he kicked 10 points in the first game kicked a lot of freeze against Dublin as well and then you look at somebody like Damien Comer and what's the knock on effect for an inside forward like him because granted it's early days but Comer seems have already made another leap again this year. Yeah, I, 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 Comer is. He's. I wouldn't say necessarily that he's unique, but he's like, you know, he is the best forward of that style. I think currently in the game, like to be that aggressive, to be that strong running, um, like you know, the old centre forwards, you know, the Trevor Giles and those guys, like they kind of became extinct because you know that's where teams place their sweeper. Mm. But fellas like Kevin McManaman and Kevin fellas like Darren O'Sullivan and, and Paul Kerrigan, that became nearly the de facto centre half forward, somebody that could carry the ball with pace, um, because they're very hard to dispossess. And uh, Comer, like you know, <laughs> he has all of that, and he's up for it every single time. You know, the aggression that he played with set the tone for, like as a forward, set the tone for everything that Galway did that day in Salt Hill against Mayo. Um, and I would absolutely have him in my team. Has the finishing ability of forwards also improved? It seems like Michael Quinlivan can score a goal from anywhere. It seems like Comer can score a goal from anywhere, and it's not because of goalkeeping errors. It's because it's right in the top corner. Uh, I would think so. You know, I mean, I you know, like people kind of lament the glory days and all the rest of it. I think that the, the skill of the inside forwards nowadays is at a much higher level because yeah. they have to do what they have to do in a shorter space of time being marked by more players. So, yeah, no, I think the, the, you know, the level of finishing ability is, is probably better than it's ever been. Like, even look at Lee Keegan. I know he's an exceptional halfback, but he's still a halfback and he's yeah. scored a couple of outrageous finishes in all our finals. And, you know, Jack McCaffrey has scored a couple of goals pinged into the top corner as well. So, yeah, no, I think teams are... Now, go, like goal chances are at such a premium now in Gaelic football at the top top level that you, you like you have to make sure you take them when they come up. One last point: there was a fear that because the Super Eights were coming in, that the league would somehow be a little bit diluted this year. But it hasn't actually been the case. Certainly, in, in we we'll wait and see what the knock-on impact on the hurling is when the hurling championship happens, and that kind of washes through. But it does seem as if teams understand that you're going to have to peak early, make sure that you've got your form and your players ready to go for making sure you make the Super Eights because ultimately. That's where the, whole, the rest of the season is going to be decided. Everything, Galway, Kildare, all the teams that would have designs of getting into the Super Eights, but couldn't be certain of getting into the Super Eights. Their whole season has to revolve around getting that. That is where it's going to be at this year. Like the Division One of the league, it's great. We have great games. They come thick and fast and everything else, but it will be completely forgotten straight yeah. away. And if you're not in the Super Eights this year, you're 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 going to miss out in a big way. I think every team that's in that will be brought on in a big way. Like the All-Ireland semi-finals this year and the final will be hugely, hugely interesting because you know, one of the big teams, a Dublin or a Kerry or a Mayo, will go in with a significant injury, a significant suspension or something like that. Um, you know, we'll have situations where Dublin are playing a big championship game in Castle Bar or in Killarney or wherever it is. Uh, and I don't think, it, until we've lived through it, we won't see how significant it is. And it might be, it might be next year that managers say, OK, we got it wrong. We went yeah. too full-blooded in the league. Like, if Galway were to miss the Super 8s this year, maybe Kevin Walsh would say, OK, staying up in Division 1 was great and all the rest of it. But, you know, we missed out on yeah. the thing that we needed to have. Like, Roscommon a couple, was, was it two years ago, yeah. started brilliantly in the league, in Division 1 flopped in the championship. Last year they got relegated on a record margin and won one Connacht. Like, yeah. you know, so Some it's kind of balance in between. Would yeah, be nice. a, I don't think it's an exact science, you know, and I think we probably have to see how this year pans out before you know, we see the effects of that next year. Yeah, I think it's almost like just to do with not even peaking too early in the season but burning out so early because you look at Roscommon two years ago and they got hockeyed in the league semi-final against Kerry. It wasn't just in the championship where they fell flat so it was kind of going from November through to April and that sort of burnout hit them in April which is absolutely incredible. But just like one last quick point, I know we're kind of out of time. Obviously Castle Bar this weekend and the league is all about seeing the one or two new players who could come through and do Mayo need that forward to come through yet? Because I'm not sure if we've seen anybody at the level of, say people are talking about Ono Dunahu now, who's been very impressive and he's talked about very, very highly in Mayo, but he's not a back. He's not a back, yeah. And Dublin have the opposite affliction. Like the one thing that Dublin, like Dublin are in a great position, that's very obvious, but the one thing that you would say they're vulnerable to is having an injury in defence. Like, the, the, like that defence has been pretty much set there. 
but they need James McCarthy now to come back in a wing back because Jack McCaffrey's been out with his cruciate. And you know, if you take out a Philly McMahon or a Johnny Cooper or a Mick Fitzsimons, the next guy in isn't as good. You know, yeah. so so if Dublin's bring an injury there, they're in bother. But we're talking about Dublin losing Bernard Brogan, a former footballer of the year, and you know, you know, they can they can absolutely absorb that loss because they have Colly Baskell has come through this yeah. year. Brian Howard is going to come through in the half forward line. You would expect that. Derek McConley is going to come back. But Mayo have the opposite affliction. They have any amount of defenders. Mm. Uh, Ono Dunne has been very good this year, but they still have Keith Higgins to come back. They still have Lee Keegan to come back. Uh, and do they need another forward to come through? They absolutely do, yeah. yeah. Connor, great stuff. Thanks very much for that. Cheers, lads. That's uh, Connor McKeown of the Herald giving us uh, his thoughts on the power rankings, and we'll put the uh, various power rankings up for you in a couple of minutes' time too.